another interesting thing about our group, right? Because Mike's kids are the oldest and my kids. So you're in a totally different journey in your life. And then mine are in this, like, my, my youngest is seven. My oldest is 16. Right. And then both Maddie and Ash, your, your, your kids are younger. So we're all these different spots in our parenting journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's crazy. Maddie, you're going to have a boy. I see your girl dad hat. You're going to go with one more. I would love to. Marie's not there. They control it more than we do. Oh, for that. I know that. I know that what we want with that doesn't matter. Actually, it has no value. Our opinion on more kids has zero percentage value in the absolute decision of what happens later. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we were talking about having some fringe conversations. Um, did you know? Like if you're if you're Jewish back in the day, Maddie, you had to keep going until you had a boy. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah, so, I can get I down know. with that. Yeah, Indian, just tell her. Indian, that same thing. Just tell her you're Jewish. <laughs> just tell her you're Jewish. Send her the link. <laughs> First, like send her a, a link that says like I'm becoming Jewish, and then like right after, send her the link of the rules. That the is rule. so funny. The rules of parenting. Oh, and by the way, we're not celebrating Christmas anymore. Just kidding. <laughs> You're going to save a bunch of money. <laughs> I would save a bunch of money if we didn't celebrate Christmas. Aaron, you have three? Four. Four kids. You have four. So is there is there an average diminishing cost after two? When they're all girls, there's like a diminishing cost because there's like this Less hand-me-down. Clothes? Because every kid has like a pair of like a dress they wore one time, two times. Shoes they wore once or twice. So when you get hand-me-downs, that's cool. When you switch to a boy after three girls, I've spent more on Brax than my three girls combined, I think, but um, because his toys are more expensive. Like, the, he likes like, Oculus and, like, Nintendo mm-hmm. and video games and, like, all the VR stuff. So, no, no, the uh, more kids makes everything harder and more fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dude, I, well, I've got that topic I wanted to start with. So the Go Matt ahead. and I, Aaron, we can pay, what? you want paper, rock, scissors, Maddie? What, um, what's the topic? I can always tee us up and then we can do kind of a round, rounded. Cover. Yeah. So they really, um, you know, we kind of ended it with, with it last time. I think there's an important conversation we can have about luck versus not. I've got like two or three stories, examples of, you know, people that like didn't pull something off and like went to jail. And people that like barely pulled stuff off and were become giant successes. And I think there's just such a fine line and there's a lot of that news happening right now. So that's what I want. It's, I don't know if it's like philosophical, if it's examples, but kind of like, you know, the concept of like success for entrepreneurs sometimes is right on the edge of extreme failure, not a little failure, extreme failure. So that's like the, so I had some stuff I kind of want to kick it off with and see what your thoughts were, your guys' thoughts were with that. I mean, I think you teen it up like that was perfect. So why, why don't you kind of kick things off and we'll get a dialogue going there. And do we have some other Start, topics that we want to segue into at some point? Any other must hit topics today? Or are we just going to kind of go where it goes? I, I wanted to talk about... Go ahead, Mike. No, no, you go. I want to talk about Vivek Ramaswamy. Okay. Dude, you guys, I mean... you, you guys following him or not? I know. I can't wait to hear about this. Okay. I want to talk about presidential candidates and see what you guys thinking or what, what you're following or what you're looking at. There might be a, like a short, quick Ukraine <clears throat> sort of conversation that might be worth having too. Like just what our thoughts are about us sending money out there. Um, I know yeah, Matt said that some people are interested in our thoughts on that. And I think, yeah, let's probably, do that. I see both sides. I, the I was King's thinking table, about, yeah, I was thinking about maybe maybe a like a lightning round of practicality because I think, you know, I mean, there's a lot of philosophical conversation, but like, you know, I don't know what have you been thinking about? Like, what's what's real to you right now? Like, one thing that I'm like, you know, as either shit's gonna hit the fan or or we're gonna, it's kind of like what you're talking about, Aaron. Like, maybe the United States is really close to implosion, or maybe we're gonna squeak by just by a thread, like you're saying with you know, investors, entrepreneurs. And so like, I've just, from a practical perspective, like, what are you thinking about right now that, that you think, you know, maybe the audience could benefit from just kind of do like a lightning round. Yeah. 
But why don't we get started? We'll see what we keep with some of that that we that you know we we've been talking for like five or ten minutes here, listeners. But welcome back to the King's Table. I think some of the stuff we just did you're gonna hear later because it was too good to not record. But I am back with my four friends today. I'm Aaron Muchastegi. I am uh, I am the trend spotter. I love real estate. I love real estate metrics and economic futures. We've got Mike Ayala on here. He is the sage that we just figured out with the highest age. He's got one of his kids getting married next week, which is just mind blowing. So tons of experience coming from him. Ashish is our hostess with the mostess, but I'm taking over for just a little while today. And then we'll hand that back. And Maddie A, Maddie Aitchison from the West Coast, my friend for a long time, the hero of hospitality. What's up, boys? What's up, bro? What it do? So good. So good. Dude, that that was good. I think good. I just got put out of a job, baby. I love it. <laughs> the We would have to rename you, and that would mess up everything we've already published on our first two episodes. So you still have it, man. Like you locked it yeah. in as you were getting started. You know, we've been texting and chatting and Instagramming all of these different articles and topics that we think are important. We've had people reaching out to us too, saying, what are your guys' thoughts on this? What are your guys' thoughts on that? And I had a kind of an interesting concept that I thought we should talk about today, at least for a little while, at least for this first half. And so there's a couple stories out there that have really been on my mind lately. And it's kind of that like we're all entrepreneurs and we've had this different versions of entrepreneur success. And when we see failure, especially failure that like hits the media, it's so easy. And I see this, like it's so frustrated because it's so easy for people to come in after the fact and really, really judge people that fail. And, and kind of say like, I'm better than, I wouldn't have done that. I can't imagine that would happen and really put people in these places. And so like one of them I was thinking lately was like the, the fire festival. You guys ever like watch the documentary on that? Yeah. So this guy that like goes after this really, really, you know, big move and he comes up with this event and he just masters social media marketing and he gets tons and tons of people, you know, to sign up uh, for this. And tons of people are signing up and going to the event. And like the long story short, if you guys have seen the documentary, kind of as the, like the last two weeks are unfolding, it was too big of a challenge. They couldn't get enough tents. They couldn't get enough people. They couldn't get the food delivered. Like the actual like operational side wasn't pulled off. And I was watching an interview that he did with uh, with Jamie Gruber, the was part of the, the Tribe of Millionaires podcast, where he said like, when did you know and he ended up going to jail. He ended up going to jail for like fraud, for all these different things. And they said like, when did you know that you actually weren't gonna pull it off? Like at what point? Cause they're raising money every day. And he says like the night before when the rainstorm hits and the tents start flying away. So up until that moment, he's like, I'm still gonna pull this off. And really like, if you think about a couple different things, like had the weather been different, would he have? right? Had like the first food supplier showed up, would he have? So almost the coolest like success ever in that thing on a short period of time becomes a big failure. We've got uh, a good friend of mine just pled guilty in federal court for like charges relating to wholesaling real estate and helping people with their down payment to buy it from him, right? A thing that I know hundreds and hundreds of people have done before in transactions. Now there was this area and he made a lot of money doing it. So when did it become bad? When did it become a crime? I mean, I have opinions that I don't think it was a crime, but like, regardless, he's pled guilty and, and he's going to see what's going to happen later. But like, was it because he had done 40 deals? Was it because there was a couple people that had too high of a like social media presence that actually crashed it? Was it because he had one person with hard feelings about wholesaling that made it unravel? And so again, it's this interesting, had he stopped at 10 or 20 after he made 30 or $40 million, would his story be that guy was a massive success? I cannot believe he went from zero to $40 million in 18 months. Cause now the story, cause as soon as he, he, he got in, in trouble, the story all over social media was like, oh, we knew that was going to happen. It was so easy for people to judge and say they knew better and all this stuff. When I talked to like first 20 or 30 people that did deals with them and they loved the deal. They were mm -hmm. excited. They all knew what they were signing up for. And so there's those interesting things. And then I think about really quickly, like one of my kind of major successes end of 2019. 
It's like beginning of 2019, we find a 1031 buyer that wants to buy $20 million of single family homes from us out in Texas. He has an apartment complex in escrow that he's supposed to sell sometimes that, that year. So in order to do that, me and my partner, JJ, were like, well, we first, we got to buy $20 million for the houses, right? To be able to do it. And really the goal was to buy like 15 or $16 million for the houses to be able to sell it to them for 20, right? But like buying them at auction. So our step was we were buying them as foreclosures. Then we were fixing them. Then we were renting them. We didn't have that much money. So we were highly levered, like 100% levered, 10 to 12% interest. So every month we're negative carry right? We're paying $1,500 a month on $1,200 a month rent. Over those nine or 10 months though, we get enough houses. And then his escrow gets delayed a couple of times, but then the escrow comes through and December, 2019, right? He sells his apartment complex. He 1031s into ours. One of our biggest successes ever, right? Transferring those over. We keep some of the ownership long-term giant, giant success. One of our biggest paydays. Now had his apartment not closed, how long could I have handled the negative carry? Had interest rates changed like they did, you know, 18 months ago on month seven or month eight, does that mean I lose it all, right? Does that mean I could have lost it all? Because really, frankly, I could have, right? Personal guarantees, all this stuff. Had a lot on the line for this giant thing. So I, I think that my journey during that time was the same as the people that are failing massively right now. Last example I'll give, and then I'm done talking the rest of the podcast, because I think that you guys will have a lot of fun <laughs> stuff on this. It's the apartment complex stuff that we talked about a couple weeks ago, where somebody buys an apartment for 10 million bucks two years ago. They get an $8 million loan on it. It's value adds making $500,000 a month. That's great. Two years later, it's making 550. They've improved values. They've done their business plan. They did everything they were supposed to. It's a better asset than it was before. The only thing that changed is Fed rates are up. So cap rates are up. So now it appraises at $8 million instead of 10. So these people, when they go to refinance on their loan due, essentially they're getting foreclosed on. They didn't do anything wrong. They did the business plan exactly the way they planned. They probably even did it better than planned. But this outside factor that came in that no one could have predicted properly now puts them out of business. So instead of being an epic success, it's an epic failure. And the same thing happens. Judges come out. Oh, everybody that was a syndicator is evil. Everybody was stupid. Why did people trust the people anyway? There were plenty of those too, where people should have never actually been the syndicator. They should have never jumped sources. But I think there's plenty of examples where they did it all right. But instead of getting to be a huge success, it's a huge failure. So that's the topic I want to talk about today. I think you guys probably have some examples. I'd love to hear maybe, um, you know, Maddie, I see you like nodding your head, kind of ready to jump in. What is what, like, what do you think about when, when I, when I kick it off like that? I think <clears throat> there's a couple different things I think of, cause if we're thinking about the same person, I said from day one, I thought what he was doing was wrong. And I, and I thought it was going to catch up with him and it did. I have nothing to bad to say about that individual in terms of their personal, you know, personal life, but it, it was one of those things where I think, you know, operators, investors, and really, I think if anything, it just shows the small margin of error and difference between life being for certain people successful and quote unquote, a failure. And I could go back on so many points in my timeline and go, man, if I would have done that a little bit differently, I would have been way more successful. Or if I would have done that a little bit differently, I would have not failed, right? Or, or it could have been a massive failure. So it is really hard, I think, to cast judgment on a lot of these scenarios. But I think there's kind of buckets that you can put it into, right? Which is fraud is fraud. Breaking the law and knowing that you're playing in a lot of people like to say, I like to play in the gray area. Well, at the end of the day, gray area is not in black and white. Therefore, you're essentially stepping into territory that you know could be categorized as out of integrity or unlawful, right? So that's a character thing for me, which is you're going into, and don't get me wrong, I've played in the gray and I've been one of those people that is a gray area player. And there are times that I have gotten caught and gotten in trouble in my life. I got expelled from high school because I played in the gray area. I got arrested in college because I played in the gray area, right? So I've had real life experiences where don't get me wrong, I like to push the envelope, but I think there's a time and a place for it. 
and we'll just talk about in the context of deals. If you want to play in the gray area with your own money, that's one thing. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that because you're taking the risk on behalf of yourself and only yourself. But now when you start thinking about syndicators and investment deals and pooling people's funds and actions and decisions that make a difference and impact in other people's lives when they have no say in that, and they've relinquished that over to you, um, I think that's where now some of the philosophical debate around what's right and what's wrong comes into play. That being said, in this climate and environment, we have seen a lot of people that, like you said, there were, you know, black swan events or extraneous factors or variables in an equation that were completely out of their control. And it took what could have been a good opportunity that turned it bad when that person had good intentions, a good plan, and the rug was ultimately pulled out from underneath them. So it's a very interesting conversation. I'm curious to kind of kick it over to Mike and, and Ashish because I think one is a character issue when you talk about making decisions that are out of alignment with your character, out of alignment with your values, or that you know really are gonna be heavily scrutinized by other people and those decisions impact other people versus it just being you and your own deal. Um, but we've seen good deals in bad markets go bad. We've seen bad operators with, you know, okay deals or bad deals go bad. And then you've just seen the people that have been straight frauds and have tried to manipulate a loophole or a part of the system that they knew was not based in integrity, wasn't fully ethical. And while you could create a narrative and spin the argument to support maybe that stance and position, I think it's pretty easy to call a spade a spade. And in certain areas of what we've seen in this market, it's exposed a lot of people that, you know, were frauds. It's exposed a lot of people that, you know, just got unlucky. And then it's also shown that, you know, when you're in the game and you do some of the right things, you know, in the win, kind of swings in your favor if you adjust your sales you can get lucky too right your example yeah. is a perfect scenario where if that dude's 1031 didn't go through and you basically were skating to where the puck was making a bet planting your flag and saying if this dude doesn't meet us to where this puck is skating we're gonna be in a hole and d does that mean your whole empire falls down maybe maybe not or you go and you look at a backup opportunity and you but that being said, I think, you know, you guys weren't doing anything illegal. And yeah. so I think there's a fine line between being illegal, unethical, lack of integrity versus people taking risks and maybe getting caught with their pants down and some unfortunate events happening. That's the big boy, big girl rule of life, you know, clause, right? Is you take risks, you put your neck out there, you do something and step outside of your comfort zone. Sometimes the chips are going to fall in your favor and you get lucky. Sometimes you're going to get unlucky. But I think there's the underlying piece, which is ethics and integrity, that is the differentiator between those individuals yeah. that had I, a deal go bad versus, you know, had an unfortunate circumstance happen. And it is what it is. I like that. And I, and I might have a couple of follow up questions for you after we hear the other guys. But I think another part of this, Ash, Mike, that I'd be curious about, too, um, is really just that idea. So had I had the 1031 not gotten through and I lost it all, everybody on social and all of our groups and everybody would, would have said, Aaron's out of his skis, shouldn't have done that. Like he should have known better, epic failure. I saw that coming. Mm -hmm. But because I pulled it off, everybody's like, amazing story, we love it, they can't wait to hear about it, they ask me about it on all the podcasts. And it's like all the fair weather friend crap out there is just another thing that like, when I'm seeing, I'm seeing, we're seeing tons of failure right now. And it bugs me that we're seeing so much kind of judgment afterward. Who's next? I'll go. So just, just the, anybody who's doing anything big is, is out over their skis at some point in time. And what I'm about to say, like, I'm not advocating for the gray area or any of that, but like, you know, over the last 10 years, um, if I talk to five different syndication attorneys about, you know, 506B versus C and what can I say on Instagram and what can I not say? And you'll get 10 different answers. Yep. And so what's a little bit, I guess, and again, I'm not advocating for the gray area. A good friend of mine, Chris Harder always says, good people 
don't do bad things. Good people in bad positions do bad things. And it's kind of like, okay, I could, I could like take that statement and split it down the middle and say, well, no, it, it, there's intent. And I'm not an attorney, but last year I sat in a courtroom for three days. Um, I owned a business that I sold in 2014. And in 2013, um, we went under contract with the Yellow Pages. This will tell you how far, how long this thing has gone on because do the Yellow Pages even exist anymore? And I'll keep this st story short, but um, I sold that business and I ended up having to go testify along with my service manager at that point in time. The guy that owns the business didn't even testify. They never even called him into the courtroom because he had nothing to say about it. So I sat in this courtroom for three days from a, something that happened in 2013. And this lawsuit's been going on for eight years and it's costed the company that I sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars defending themselves in a contract lawsuit that we ended up winning. And afterwards, I don't know if you guys, this is the only time I've ever gone to court or, or been in a jury trial, but just watching this theatrics was super interesting to me because it, it's, it's just that, it's theatrics. And, and I started realizing like, okay, there's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of facts in the case. And then you got this jury sitting over there that's like, the, the attorneys are prepping us for two years. And they're like, I'm not gonna tell you what to say, but here's how I want you to dress. And you know, the jury, the jury, even, even the day of, cause I wasn't in jury selection, but even the day of, they're like, hey, don't wear that tie that we were talking about. They like wanted me to dress down a little bit. So I was like, I'm watching all of this. And I'm like, I think we have the best legal system in the world. But also at the end of the day, like what I realized is when you get over, just like you were talking about, like social media being the jury, there's an actual jury. And then there's a judge in the jury with all of our peers and everything else. And so I have so many thoughts around this. You know, somebody brought something up about, um, you know, social media and, you know, in this day and age, we have to be so careful, not just with advertising for raising capital, but also just advertising in general. Cause Aaron, like you said, you know, we, we use it for marketing and eyeballs and attention, but it can also be a double-edged sword because so many people have, if somebody failed 30 years ago, you know, maybe a hundred people would know about it. But when you fail today, like th the bigger your social media following, you know, the, the bigger the fallout. And so I, I think I'm just, I'm not like really an armchair quarterback anyway, but after watching that whole, by the way, again, I, I said this, but we won that lawsuit. They just reached out to me the other day because they want me to come testify next year in another lawsuit, yellow pages against another company. And I'm like, mm -hmm. this, this is, this is crazy. A racket. <clears throat> it is. It's a racket. And at the end of the day, by the way, I'm not advocating again for, you know, the gray area or fraud or anything else. But when people, when just after watching that whole scenario, I'm, I'm kind of slower to judge like what's actually going on. Um, even if somebody gets convicted or doesn't just because yeah. somebody doesn't get convicted, doesn't mean they weren't guilty. <laughs> and just because somebody gets convicted, doesn't mean, you know, that they, and there's another part of this. Doesn't mean like they were intent. guilty. Yeah. Or yeah, even mean they were guilty. Did they mean to? You know, was their intent? Because this is the thing that is so beautiful about our legal system. But just because I accidentally got myself in a situation doesn't mean I'm not guilty. It's just, you know, I might have a lesser charge because the jury and the judge and everything sees that. And so I, it, I'm, I'm kind of out in this gray area on my own, but I'm just kind of, I'm slower to judge because I can see so many times when somebody gets themselves in trouble or has a win, you know, there's so many times that I've won and I'll, and I'll kick it over to Ash or whoever. There's so many times that I won where I've said, you know, even my first business, Inc. Fastest growing companies in America, hundred employees. I won because of luck. There was so much luck involved in that. I was so young and naive that I had to hire consultants and coaches and, and, and get out of my own way. I had to hire people so fast because I was so unskilled at business, leadership, accounting, sales, that I had no freaking clue what I was doing. And that's what made me a success. So, you know, we could look back at my success and I've said this so many times in Emerge, Ascend, everywhere I'm speaking, I'm like, well, what was the key to your success? <laughs> I was so naive that I just listened, I paid experts and I just did exactly what they said and guess what, it works. And so, I don't know, I came out of the other side of that looking like a genius when I sold my business in 2014, but really it was just a lot of luck. There's a lot of, a lot of luck. I, I don't know. Sorry, go ahead, Mooch. <clears throat> no, go for it. I was gonna. Firstly, I was gonna 
disagree with Mike because I think I think that you're saying you're lucky. So here here's my my two cents about all this. I actually have a lot of thoughts here. This is a really great topic, Mooch. Really, really good. So firstly, I think that you have to have skill in order to deal with unlucky or lucky situations. So Mike, you say you were lucky, but in reality, the skill that you had, which you can touch and feel, you can't touch and feel luck, but the skill that you had is that you knew that you didn't know anything. So you had to hire people, right? So is that lucky? I don't know. So the, the, the luck perhaps was market trends. You were in a good, you were in a good market. It was growing. The economy was good. You're in America. You're a healthy, you know, male. Like those things I suppose are, are lucky things you cannot necessarily control. But the, I think it goes back to like, well, what skills do you have and skills are you deploying to deal with either luck or unlucky situations? And Mooch, you know, there's a big, when you, when you go to your example about the deal you were talking about a few, a few years ago and, um, Matt basically communicated this, but I'm going to reiterate, I think there's a big difference between taking risk and doing things that are illegal. And I think that everyone lives in the spectrum between risk and what is illegal. And in reality, nowadays, if 10 lawyers are going to tell you different things, even the lawyers don't know what's legal. So everybody has to have a different barometer of how far am I allowed or willing to push it? Going back to, um, I think all entrepreneurs really fake it till you make it, right? Mm -hmm. We have to fake it till we make it. By definition, we are frauds. By definition, we are selling something Selling 100%. a story, selling confidence, selling uh, the ability to deliver a product. Let me tell you guys what I do. I, somebody tells me to make something that they've never seen before off of an image or a scrap or concept. I have to go on the other side of the world. I have to make it hundreds and hundreds of them on the other side of the planet something we've never touched or made before with completely custom finishes and designs, ship it across the world within a 10 to 12 week period of time. And that product has to last up to 10 years. Never made it before. And so there, there is an inherent nature of faking it till you make it, solving the problem until the storm comes. And I think what's really fun about this conversation is is that I think that what you're exposing here, Mooch, is that human character, especially sideliners, fans, people sitting on the sidelines, love to be critics, to be watching the game and saying, I don't have the guts to get on the field and play, but I have no problem giving feedback of, dude, Mooch, man, he was so over his skis. I know better. I know I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have done that, man. yeah. I wouldn't have done that or, or the envy syndrome of, oh man, I sh I, I'm going to listen to him because he seems to know what he was doing. You may or may not have known. You may have had the skill, but you also had the luck that the deal closed on time. You could have also been unlucky that the deal didn't close, but it doesn't take the skill away. And then the last thing I'll share, and we can turn it back and have a deeper conversation. I think I've really been thinking about this concept about the difference between righteousness and narcissism. Okay, so mm. let me elaborate here. Mm. So in leadership, in, in anything that you're doing, doing a deal, selling, having employees, building a business, selling a product, raising capital, everything is about convincing and influencing people. And by doing that, we define what is righteous. We define, a, we are chasing a vision. This is our mission. This is why we are doing what we're doing. We are right in our direction. We are right in the decisions that we make. We are right, um, you know, you define what is right and wrong. And, the, and, and I've experienced this personally. I've seen it in other people that what you end up doing is you, there's a really thin line between righteousness and narcissism. 
because you start to convince people so much that you're right, then now it becomes self-serving. It no longer becomes right. It's only right because you said it was right. Doesn't mean it was really right. And so I think, and I think there's, that goes back to like the whole, you know, fake it till you make it like uh, imposter syndrome. So it, it's a little bit of a philosophical comparison, but I think that's where the lines are. I think there's a difference between risky and illegal. I think there's a difference between righteous and narcissism. And, and you have to be really self-aware about when is it that I'm over the skis and taking risk or where is it that I'm over the skis and doing things that are illegal until I get caught? When, when am I being a little too righteous and when am I now tipped over into being narcissistic and it's going to, I'm going to pay for it. So those are, those are my thoughts, but I, I love this topic. Let's keep going. Yeah. So much good stuff that you guys have started with, with this, you know, and I, and I keep thinking of more like Elizabeth Holmes and the, uh, the Theranos stuff where when you see that documentary totally committed a bunch of fraud to keep people on board to like sell their contracts and things like that. But had they at the last moment been able to deliver the product that they were supposed to, the story's different. It's gazillionaires. And it would even be probably something people would laugh about. Like we tricked our investors into staying and we pulled it off at the last minute. There's the old story of like Bill Gates selling Microsoft before he owned rights to like the mouse, right? Like if you watch the old movie, Sil you know, Pirates of Silicon Valley, right? Somebody else had like built a computer and had this and he had no rights to it yet. And then he went and sold it as if he owned it. And now Bill Gates is Bill Gates, right? He was committing fraud. He was living in the gray. Like it was illegal. Yet he's like taking over the world, you know, and the, and we just have those moments. I really like that idea of like fake it till you make it is required in business. You hear that all over the podcast. If you're in sales, somebody says, Hey, can you do this? The answer isn't like, I think so. We might, we've never done it before. Let me yes, try. we can do this. The answer is we can do this. <laughs> have you done it before? Like most people are saying, Oh yeah, we've done it before. And not thinking that that's like fraud at that moment. I just think that like almost every successful entrepreneur that's hit it, that's hit home runs has been in that gray, has been right on the edge of like, could be fraud, could be not. Yet so many of those entrepreneurs are also very quick to judge others. I think, and let me, let me respond to that really fast. I think that there's a, if all the best entrepreneurs in the world are by definition chasing something that hasn't ever been done yep. or something that's quite different than what exists, right? Yeah. And we're, I think by, yeah, I mean, that's where, that's where the gray space lives it's to try well, things if, unless you hit a wall. If you even look at, if you think about, I remember when I joined the real estate guys mastermind in 2016, like one of the first exercises we did in the mastermind was like going through the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So you have to take this, like you're, you're like, you're, you're, you're dissecting just like Frodo, right? Like I'm like Frodo, I'm like a nobody. And then they're like, no, no, you've done some things, but we just have to really mine it out of you. And so like you're, we're taught to like write this story and almost not embellish, but embellish like they're, you know, you're, you're making it a better version of yourself. And, and it, it's almost like, I, I'm just thinking about how there's so many things in our society today that almost lean us this direction or desensitize us. I'm thinking about breaking bad, like who doesn't feel for Walt. Like yeah. Walt has cancer and he needs to, you know, he needs to like leave something for his family. And so he, this, this poor old guy that's like been, you know, straight edge his entire life now comes down with cancer and he's got no insurance and the school district is like screwing him. And so he becomes like one of the most ruthless meth dealers in the world. He's a murderer. And you're yep. like, I, I can kind of see how you got here, Walt. Like it's crazy. It's like, yeah, Matt, what do you think? I mean, for me, I just think at the end of the day, there's going to be a narrative and a lens in which everyone can find something to support the actions and the decisions that they take. Right. And so for me, I agree. It's a totally different dynamic in the world we live in with social media and how the keyboard warriors and the trolls and the gremlins have this direct shot and transparency into so many people's lives now, which creates a lot of different dynamics from, you know, a social construct. That being said, and I'll just speak from my own 
perspective, I judge people every day. That's just the truth. And I know people judge me every day. By human nature, you be judge. And I'm okay judges. with that. I'm okay with that. I've gotten, especially now with the world we live in, there's been some, I call it rhino skin. I tell my, my daughters about rhino skin. Like rhino skin is very hard to penetrate. And you could shoot arrows at it. You could throw daggers at it. And it, it, it takes a lot of damage to really be able to get underneath the skin and hurt the rhino. And so as time has gone on, I've developed my own, you know, sense of rhino skin in the world of business and with relationships and all of the things that we all as humans now deal with on a daily basis. I think the people that are out there taking the risks are already aware of the um, potential upsides and downsides of being the man, quote unquote, in the arena, right? But for me, my judgment comes of others every day around, and it's through the lens of my my values and my core values. And so that's where I think at the end of the day, if you've got strong core values and you feel like you have clarity on your own moral compass, you can judge other people with an understanding and respect that they may be different than you, but also at the end of the day, it still comes back to my final judgment, which is alignment with my values or misalignment with my values. And when I think about in the context of a lot of deals that have gone bad, when I get to the bottom of all of it, right? Cause there's a lot of gray area in a lot of these deals. My final judgment and decision around something being lucky or unlucky or good or bad or whatever duality of topic you want to, you know, kind of classify it as is, was it morally okay? And was it ethically okay or not? And I think it's pretty easy if we could all say, for the most part, probably all align on what we believe to be moral and right and wrong and fraudulent and ethical and unethical and integrity based or non integrity based. And that's where I make my final decision. The guy that we're talking about, Mooch, do I think he is the worst piece of shit person on the planet and went out there looking to defraud everybody and do all of that? No, I, I'm not going to. But do I think he knew what he was doing was wrong and that it would potentially take one deal going bad? that he could be in a lot of trouble. I think any smart person in that position outside looking in, especially with somebody that was way close to everything that was going on, knew that this is probably if I go and get caught and they go through everything, there can be a pretty strong case that what I was doing was wrong. And I yeah. think that's where people make a decision on crossing that line or not of going from this was gray area to now I'm playing in an area that I think is wrong. And and I think that's where the narcissist of going from righteous to narcissist, if you look at the definition, I just wanted to, this is from WebMD, so take it with a grain of salt. But that being said, <laughs> a narcissist is extreme self-involvement to a degree that it makes a person ignore the needs of what's right or wrong of others around them. While someone may show occasional narcissistic behavior, true narcissists frequently disregard the impacts on other people's feelings or well-being. And so when you think about that of going, well, this is a win for everybody and I'm winning and I'm making a lot of money, but so are they. So it's okay because we're all making money together. But then when you start getting into an arena where stuff you know, you start convincing yourself of all of these reasons why it was okay, even though if it goes wrong, now all of a sudden the arguments and the narrative can be completely different. That's where I think it's a shift from righteousness to narcissism. And I think we all, at the end of the day, I'll raise my hand, are narcissistic in our own ways. And yeah. I think there's healthy levels of narcissism. And I also think that there are very unhealthy levels of narcissism that again philosophical debate 
you can argue both sides of that coin. So I think, again, it's really challenging because there's always an argument, there's always a narrative, there's always a data set that we as human beings can now pull from to make an argument to support our position and stance. Well, I'm going to try to I'm going to try to wrap this topic with a couple of things and a quick fire round for you guys and some summaries that I still think make it interesting. And listeners, let us know what you think about the conversation. I love the idea of like pulling the narcissistic part into it and the and trying to give the user some action items too. like, well, like what what can they make of all this or what would I think? And my action items may be different than everybody else's. I think what's again unique about the the situation that we're talking about is there's tons of classes. Just say who it is and say what they did. Tell no, us what the court not, case number is. We can bleep it out. It's okay. The, not today, buddy. Not today. <laughs> well, the, we're, we will. We'll see it. We don't, and we're on we don't there. have that much no, notoriety yet. We could just say the, who it is. It's we, all good. We can say all of our stuff. The funny part is there's so many courses out there that teach people exactly how to do that with wholesaling houses, right? There's paid classes that say, do this for a hundred thousand dollar house, buy it for 60, sell it for a hundred. You're going to sell or finance the $40,000 for the down payment. And you're going to send it to them ahead of time at a hundred thousand dollar houses. Nobody cares. Same business plan with a $10 million property. Or <laughs> if rates are at 3% today, instead, nobody's complaining about any of those deals rates being Mooch, at let me, seven. Mooch, let me interrupt you and ask you a question. Does size matter? Yes, of course. So, so the so I think that that's so Does when we're it? talking when when we're talking philosophical ethical, I say no, right, right, because I think it's the same philosophical ethical question. But nobody seems to care about the hundred thousand dollar house, but they care about the ten million dollar when it's the same. I mean, action. Would any have would anyone have cared if Fire Festival was was for fifteen people and some private island that that got fucked up? But it wasn't. It was for like five thousand. Huh? Or SBF, or like yeah, or like Sam Bankman Free, like the like the if, yep. if the size ten, matter in hurt. this case. So I guess with your thing, I would say size does because the more people that are affected, but it might not even be quantity; it's the dollar volume. But like, what is that impact? And, so, and we're not even talking about legal because, like, even if even if even if your friend didn't, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Because sooner or later, if it affects too many people, it becomes a legal situation, anyways. Yeah. So the so as we but try got, to wrap this, I got a I got a I got a question for you, Aaron. Being that you're you're friends with him and you don't think that he did anything wrong, right? Yeah. That's your that's your stance. Yep. So so when he started doing things that on paper are written as illegal or steering or not fully transparent, how do you argue that those are not morally wrong? Knowing that, and there's a lot of nuances to this that obviously the listener doesn't understand, but doing certain things that he was doing with the bank, knowing that covenants and laws around that are pretty clear, how can you make an argument that that was not wrong? Yeah. So no legal advice here, guys, but we try to figure out what we can do. So Maddie, if I'm going to buy a house and I say, Maddie, can you loan me $40,000 for the down payment? Just you're my buddy. Can I borrow mm -hmm. 40 grand? I put it in my account. The I go, I go buy my house with that $40,000 down payment. Next year, I pay you back your 40 grand. Is that anyone's business? When it, when it comes to a lending requirement with a third party, if it's just you and I, I yeah. agree. That's that's who, the big boy who, com move. who completed the crime. Who did the crime? Did I do the crime by signing the document saying nobody gave me this money, or did you commit the crime by loaning me forty grand? I would think there's culpability on both sides if it was fully transparent and disclosed that that is exactly what was happening. And so, so I, also I bet a bunch of people that we know have loaned somebody money for down payment for real estate, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. the, that's the crime. That's actually the, like the person actually buying a property saying, nobody gave me this money. Like that's the, that's the illegal covenant. If again, if Mike loans me 50 grand to go buy a house and the, and like, if it's as illegal, so that's, that's essentially the crime that's in place, assisting a down payment. Uh, and I think the people signing loan documents are more culpable than people loaning money for that. I don't I like, 
It's I just don't think that if you loan me money that you should go to jail if I committed fraud. But I think it's the same thing, right? Like when a bank is qualifying a borrower, right? And they think that there is money coming from a third party, what do they do? They go through and underwrite that gifting very significantly. Right. They're gonna, yeah, they're gonna ask me, where'd Correct. you get that money? Correct. Right. Right. So, so, I, so I think there's culpability on all sides of it. But if we're talking about right and wrong, there is in this particular transaction, whether it's this party, this party, or this party, there was fraud in every aspect of right. this. Deal. So, so if you loan me forty, if you loan me forty grand to buy a house, you're committing fraud. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. All right. Committing, who's committing fraud? Matt's committing fraud by <laughs> giving him the money. Every, so that's the question because that's every that's person actually in this transaction knew what they were doing and knew that they were trying to pull a fast one without going the traditional legal way of the way these deals should have been structured. Would you loan somebody money for a down payment on a property? A yeah, a I mean, I like, look, I, I'm not, I'm not as sophisticated as you guys bet. when it comes I to have. this, but like, if Mikey called me and said, Hey dude, I, I have, I have three deals I'm trying to close right now. I think this is, this is the big, big boy deal details, you know, send me 50 grand or a hundred grand. Like, okay, I, I trust Mike. Now, do I know why would I think that I'm somehow doing something illegal by sending here's, him money? Like, I mean, it's not, not that uh, look, I'm yeah, speaking out of ignorance, right? That's, Matty? that's, that's the moral ethical part of it to me. I think it's, a, I think it's, a, I think it's the same thing. I know Matt, you think it's something different and we don't need to well, beat the, 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 I, the dead horse. I, on. Ac actually, I don't, I think the difference here, um, and I've, this is a good educational thing for it's people. It's a fascinating too. topic. I think it's a fascinating, it fascinating is. topic. It, yeah, because there's I, a lot of arguments to be made on both sides. I would just say the only caveat before you answer. It's Mike's turn, bro. <laughs> the nope. only caveat was that <laughs> they knew that that down payment was the only way the deal was going to get done. If it was just, hey, I need the money, that's one thing. But if it's, hey, this is the way it has to be done in order for this deal to go through. That's where uh, the wrong. So I'm like, yes. Maddie, yeah. Maddie, a, loan me 50 grand. No questions asked is legal. Maddie, a, loan me 50 grand so I can buy this house. Illegal. All right, Mike. Well, I was, I, I, I have some, I know someone very well that was involved in something very similar. I won't say it's this, but, um, it, when I think the difference, Ash, if, if you let me $50,000 and, and I take that $50,000 and I go do some separate deal with it. And it's a legitimate fifty thousand dollar loan, and you have no, you know, insight into the deal or anything else. I don't think that's really an issue. I think what happened here is the guy is wholesaling, and the buyer who's buying the deal from him both know what's happening, and they're the ones that are. So the the guy that's selling the wholesale deal is the one that's lending the money to the buyer, and so they're both very very aware of what's mm. happening in the situation. So. I, I think that's where, by the way, I happen to know for a fact, um, in a, in a similar situation, I won't say it, it was in this deal, but, um, the Pretty bank <laughs> also knew what was going on. Yep. The bank, the bank also knew what was going on. And so I think that's the only saving grace that's probably, you know, could have some, um, I guess maybe and a attorneys. little bit of, yeah. So and what is the attorney said, an attorney said, this is legal and bank said, we know. So what is the, this is a good, this is a good topic because this is good for people to learn about what to do and what not to do. Right. For um, sure. We're kind of going fastball here, but what specifically is illegal? Dude, what so is the illegal behavior? Okay. If you let me, let's like, just say, the, I'll go, I'll go, yeah. I'll go back to Aaron's, I'll go back to Aaron's case. And so let's just say that we're financing just to keep it smaller. We're, I'm going to a bank to borrow, you know, to finance a house for $200,000. And I need to put sixty thousand dollars down. You're you're the seller. You're you're wholesaling me this house, and I need sixty thousand dollars cash to as the buyer that I don't have. The bank's making me put that sixty thousand dollars down. I don't have that sixty thousand dollars. So you say to me, I'm going to lend you that sixty thousand dollars after the fact as the seller. Yeah, but just yes. But then the bank says to me, Where did you get that sixty thousand dollars? And I'm, and then I kind of hide it and we figure it out and, and I'm not disclosing that I got it from you. And, um, and maybe the bank doesn't care because, you know, the bank, 
not the bank, but the person that's doing the loan mm -hmm. doesn't care because they want fees. They just want to close, right? This is where I think the whole web gets tangled up because I don't want to say the bank doesn't care because the bank cares, the underwriters care, the, the government, everybody cares, except the three people that are near and dear to the transaction, the guy that wants to close the loan, the guy that's wholesaling the house in this scenario, and then me, the buyer who doesn't have the money. And so we're all falsifying documents, basically saying, you know, my grandma gave me this money or, and it's probably just a disclosure that like we're in this period of time where people don't actually care. Like they don't do the, so due where's diligence. the harm? So I guess you're, you're, you're saying you're signing documents that say there's nothing nefarious going on. So that's probably some contractual harm done because you're saying on bank documents that I don't know where I got this money or whatever, which is fine. But like normally legal things happen because somebody actually got hurt one day and, and that's why we have law. So like what, what is, who's getting harmed by three people trying to do a deal and doing something creative? Is the if bank market, getting hurt? If market goes up, nobody cares. Nobody gets hurt. True. If, if the market goes down, bank gets hurt because they had to foreclose on or the person that buys it gets foreclosed on the actual moment that could that the the only part of the document of le any loan that i've ever done has a line on it that says this down payment is coming from my own funds and i have to initial it and sign it every loan anybody ever does and usually it's like among a bunch of things so people are just signing 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 but everyone is saying this is my money i'm using as a down payment i've never had a seller's document that said you know did you loan it? Like I've never had a seller's document that said I was where I was signing something saying that I didn't do that. So I think my, so hmm. anyway, where, where it's legal or illegal, I think that there, where I think it's without question is when you sign a loan document that says these funds are mine as a buyer. That to me without question is that's you're operating outside that gray and you could be worried. And the reason like banks and people didn't care is because they wanted to make money and they thought the market was going up and the markets change. That's what we're going to see a lot of this stuff over the next year because the market has changed. We're going to see syndicators getting sued for charging too many fees. And if the market had gone up, they haven't, you know, and there's people, I just, I just wanted us to shed light as we like close this up. So we have time for a couple extra things is it's like this gray area happens and the race happens. And, you know, somebody goes from single family to hospitality like Maddie and it's a success and it becomes this amazing story. And somebody you know, goes from single family. I'm going to build a tower in downtown Austin someday. And if it works out perfect, it's an amazing story. And if it doesn't, they're going to say, what business did Aaron have doing a tower in downtown Austin? And I know somebody that's, that's, you know, went into some big hotel projects that like, now it's easy to say like, oh, they shouldn't have been doing that. They didn't have the experience, but if it would have been a success, I would have thought it was great. So it's so easy to be a backseat pilot. My advice to our listeners is try not to judge over the next year because we don't see all the different pieces of it because a bunch of this stuff is going to happen. More and more of it's going to happen. And if the market kept going up, nobody would have cared. Nobody would have gone to jail. Nobody would be getting sued. This only happens when the market changes. I saw a ton of it in 2009, a ton of it in 2010. And that's why we were even more prepared with the way we did our funds. We knew that when the market goes down, that's when people get sued for those fees. Why well, we don't charge fees in any of our stuff. We only do profit share because we didn't want there to ever be that. I remember... Mike, your court idea, just rapid fire. We were in a, we, you know, we, we'd won every lawsuit we ever did. And one of our more, more recent ones we were in though, that we had somebody suing us. We sold him a house like 10 years ago. And the judge that was the mediator said, look, you're hundred percent right. You a hundred percent disclosed everything. You guys have done nothing wrong, but the buyer is a nurse and a firefighter. And so when you go in front of the jury, they're going to say, does Aaron, the guy that has this many houses, does he deserve the money or not? And he said, you are not in the wrong at all. And he's a judge. And he says, but you're a hundred percent going to lose. You're a hundred percent going to lose. You should settle and write him a check right now because you're a hundred percent innocent, but the person suing you is a doctor and a lawyer. So don't judge people. Don't judge on settlements because there are times when you could be a hundred percent innocent and have to plead guilty to something or have to pay totally. something because you're managing risk. Hey, you might do 25 years, you might do zero, but if you plead guilty, you might do two. I had that happen when I was 20. They said, That's a good point. They said, if you don't plead guilty, you're doing 25 years. If you plead guilty, you're doing two, but you might get off because you do have some rights that like maybe, maybe you're going to do zero. And I had to make a calculated decision to try not to judge. And then the other thing that I think is probably the coolest thing for people right now is be aware of when you are lucky. I was in Sacramento in 2009 when the foreclosure crisis happened. 
if I was in Colorado or I was in Oregon or I was in Washington, I wouldn't have the story that I had. So we all have luck in our stories. Mike's timing, Ash's timing, Matt's timing. So listeners, when you're out there, entrepreneurs, when you're thinking about your journey or you're thinking about gray or you're thinking about illegal, know that like risks sometimes don't pay off. The market doesn't always go up. And also when you're in that moment and you actually are experiencing luck, when I got to Texas in 2015 and I stood at that auction, I was the only person saying at the auction, I was like, oh my God, this is my second chance. When you have luck hit you, everyone will have those lucky moments, some more than others realize it and go, okay, this is, this is my moment. Mm. I think we got to change I, topics. Well, Ash, well, well I, I have, I, I'd you like guys, to guys study. Go, Ram- go Mikey, go. Well, I was just going to say, and this is on the subject of changing topics, but kind of not really. We've talked a lot about fraud and a gray area, but I think the luck conversation is maybe something that is a little bit more because I mean, we could all be exposed to some fraud and the things that are coming and everything else. But you know, I think of the book three feet from gold and, and what's the difference between the person that says I went bankrupt and I almost went bankrupt. I was listening to, uh, Jamie Kern Lima. She was speaking to a small group that I'm involved with like, like a month ago and just hearing her story of no, 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 for like seven years. And I mean, they, they were, they were almost like they were, they were broke for so many years and then boom, she's an overnight success and sells to L'Oreal or one of them for a billion dollars. And all we hear is like the billion dollar story, but she had so many stories of, of no and failure. And they, 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 they had like another week before they were going to lose their apartment, not even a house. Like, and so there's so many stories where it's like, I'm just wondering, an old mentor of mine said, I just don't have any quitting sense. Like, I just Mm. don't know when to quit. And so I think that's maybe just a, Uh, whether we do it today or another time, that's the other part of the story that Aaron introduced in the beginning. And we spent a ton of time on, you know, the fraud and the failure part. But like, I think just the fine line between, you know, the, the billionaires and, and he who's broke is just that it's such a fine line. The fire festival hurricane. Uh, uh, The only thing I'm going to add to that, Mikey, is like this, I feel like this is a season that we're coming into of economic chaos, which often creates the most luck. So I'd love to see some like statistical evidence of successful entrepreneurs today. When, when was the average date those people started? Was it like 2014, 15, or was it 2008, 2009? Was it, was it after COVID? Was it 2001? Was it 1991? Like what these big economic cycles of chaos when things crap the fan right when when things just blow up is is most of the luck in a bottle sitting at those moments where people are like okay i'm gonna jump on these opportunities and i'm gonna go after it and this is why you have to listen to this podcast because this is where those ideas are going to come from because i really think that the next couple months weeks we're going to start unpacking okay where's the next where's the next 10x luck to be had and um and some of us may experiment with those things who knows I, I think you're I think you're right in the sense that there's like opportunity and there is big winners during this time. But I think again, back to the no quitting sense. I think yeah, it's, I, I think it's a certain it's like a certain type of individual that you know whether whether you're coming into seasons of opportunity and recession or whether you know things are coasting along and doing well. Like there's a certain you know for the audience, I think there's a certain type of individual um, that it's just that like I'm just gonna keep going and. And how many times have I almost been bankrupt? I've never been bankrupt. And I'm not saying that, you know, I, I don't know if I ever will be, but I've never been yet. And, and I could have been so close (laughs) to, to it so many times. There's in 2007, I had, we were, we were growing so much and I had so many employees and we had a gold mine that I had crews working 24 seven around the clock. We were billing three to $400,000 a week to this gold mine. And one day I get a phone call at 6.30 in the morning from my foreman. And he says, "There's a the gate is locked and there's a chain on it and there's security everywhere here. And I was like, what? These guys were in trouble. The main reason why we were working there around the clock, time and material, was because the EPA had shut them down. Well, they ran out of money. So this was a Canadian company that ran out of money. They couldn't get enough money anymore. And they put a lock on the gate. These guys owed me $400,000. And I had them on a seven-day pay timeline. 
$400,000 was a lot of money for me at that point in time. And I literally thought I was going to go bankrupt. And I'm telling you about the quit and sense. I immediately, I was like, what in the hell am I going to do? And I'm, so I'm, I'm reading articles and I, I'm sharing this because there's some insight into like, <laughs> it's almost like we're so like hard headed yep. that like we just keep going. And so I'm like, $400,000 is going to bankrupt me. Like literally I've paid my guys, I've paid material. Like I don't, I'm not, I'm not at a place where I can survive this. And so I I'm reading the articles, I'm watching the news. And I saw that the guy, uh, this guy's name was Graham. He was the CEO and he got fired that morning and they put a temporary CEO in place who was the frat. He was the temporary CFO and they put him in, in a CEO. His name was Sean Heinrichs. I got it in the newspaper. And I remember one of my mentors telling me, if you need favor with someone, you got to get in front of them. They have to see your face. And so I tracked down the, the Vancouver offices. I'm living in Nevada. I, I find the Vancouver office phone number and I call and I say, this is, this is why all this is going down. I'm like, can I speak with Sean Heinrichs? And you guys are not going to believe this. The receptionist is like, can I ask who's calling? And I'm like, this is Mike from Queen State Gold in Nevada. I didn't say I was a vendor. <laughs> I just said, this is Mike from Queen State Gold in Nevada. And she's like, hold please. This is Sean. And I was like, holy crap. And so I've got Sean Heinrichs on the phone and I'm like, Sean, I'm one of your vendors. We have been over backwards to serve you guys. I'm sure you are getting bombarded right now. I know you're in the middle of a shit storm. I'm actually going to be in Vancouver this Wednesday. Can I come just sit down with you for a minute? And he's like, sure. What time works for you? And I'm like, one o'clock. I was not going to be in Vancouver. <laughs> there was no way I thought this guy was going to sit down with me. I jumped on an airplane, went to Vancouver, went to their corporate offices, sat down with Sean Heinrichs. And I'm like, bro, you are going to bankrupt me. Like this is going to put me under. And he's like, listen, I know it's not a lot, but I've got an emergency fund here. I can get you like $150,000 right now. The rest of it's probably going to have to go through bankruptcy, but I can get you 150 K right now. He wrote me a freaking check right there on the spot. And then as things progressed and went on, I had this line of communication with Sean Heinrichs. I stayed out of all the legal battles, the bankruptcy, everything else. I got paid out in four months. It took everybody else like five years to get paid out just from that mm. little, like no quit and sense. Like, so I'm just wondering, like the companies that got put under where did, did they just give up? And there's all these little, like who would think that little thing that Barry Lipperelli put in my head of, if you need favor with somebody, you got to get in front of them, Sean, <laughs> like, there's no way I thought this guy was going to answer my phone. And then I'm like, I'm going to be in Vancouver. I'm making this shit up as I go. And then I get paid out. And so I'm just wondering, like, was that luck? Or, or was mm. that like tenacity? And so that, anyway, I'll toss it back, but I've just seen so many times in my life where I could have went bankrupt so easy, but you know, I asked, Hey, can I borrow money? Hey, can you help me out with this? Hey, can you, you know, I mean, what do I do here? Right. Serendipity. The not giving, the not giving up is kind of, it's, it is profoundly everything with every one of our stories. It's like, so what is it the is. next, what is the next step forward? <laughs> Like, what is the next opportunity? And it's about not giving up until that, like, next opportunity happens. That's why I love to say when when I, I echo what Mike says, when, when people are asking me, like, how did you have success? And what was your magic formula and this and that? I have the worst answer ever, but I have, I think, what is the best mantra ever that anyone can subscribe to, which is just be dumb enough to believe in yourself every single day and smart enough to take action. And, and it's like, I've just been, I'm not the smartest. I'm not the fastest. I'm not the strongest. You know, I, I'm not the most skilled. I'm just really fucking dumb to be so confident in myself every day and show up and work my ass off every day that I believe the chips will fall where they will fall, knowing that my effort is where it's going to be at every day. And I think that in itself creates so much luck for so many people. I think we all have our own bankrupt stories. Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard Aaron's, I've heard Mike's, I know Ash has probably got some along the way. I mean, I remember when 2020 March hit and they were shutting down all the hotels. I was like, I'm done for. Like, yeah. there's no way I can carry this debt service for this long, knowing who knows where this pandemic is going to go you know, not knowing that they were going to open up three months later and hotels and travel was going to go bananas. 
my story could have been complete opposite where I was filing for bankruptcy and giving keys back to the hotels versus now my hotel values are doubling and tripling with me practically doing nothing except just continuing to operate them well. Right. But I was just dumb enough to believe in myself and smart enough to show up and try and do the next best thing that was aligned with my goals and my vision. And I think having good counsel and good people around you is so critical and key. Right. The fact that Mike is referring back to a mentor that planted a quote and a seed that kept him out of bankruptcy and led to who knows what path he has been on because of that, I think is a testament for every entrepreneur, every person going after goals, big dreams, big passions is there will always be lots of opinions. There will always be lots of hooks that pull you in one direction or another. But if you have an unwavering belief in yourself and you're just smart enough to show up and take action and chisel away at that, you know, that gold mine that you're chipping away on, whatever that might be, we're all pretty much three feet from gold if we don't give up and you don't need to be that skilled, capitalized or, you know, experienced. But if you don't believe in yourself and you don't show up every day to chip away at what needs to get done, you're not ever going to achieve the success that it is that you desire. And that's just my belief. Yeah. Well, with all this, I've got a one minute fire round question. We'll go to at the very end of the podcast. So we'll come back to it. I got one question that I think everybody will be able to answer as we close. Out. I think it'll be interesting. But for now, I need to hand the captain chair back over to Mr. Ash so you can close, you know, so you can hit these last couple topics for us. So you are the captain now. Okay, what are we talking about? <laughs> Man, there's so many people want to hear about Ukraine. They want to hear presidential candidates. They want to, you know, what do you want to talk about? I guess, uh, what are we doing? Like closing rounds, quick, like what's on everyone's thoughts? Um, you know, I, I feel. I mean, I'm in the global global supply chain world, moving product, manufacturing, China. Um, and so my worldly views are are becoming more and more expansive. Um, you know, China is really going through something um, pretty intense here. The currency is changing quite a bit. Um, factories are hurting. Um, people are hurting. The real estate industry in China is hurting. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens here. And, you know, we're on the brink of something too here in the U.S. And as major trade partners, as major rivals, um, I think that there's going to be some really interesting things to watch. And we as a business are pretty dependent on the supply chain of China. And so, you know, and we've chosen not to significantly move operations from China to elsewhere for other reasons. We're not going to waste our time now. But so that's going to be really interesting. Um you know, we're expanding into the Middle East and going into Southeast Asia and all over the world. So I think that's going to be uh, uh, something I'm going to be able to bring more global insight on what's happening all around the world. I'm really fascinated with the political race specifically. Um, and, I, and I don't mind sharing it here. Like I'm really enjoying and watching this guy Vivek Ramaswamy. And I'd love to get you guys' feedback on who you're watching. Um, you know, I, I've been studying him for the last three to four months he's growing like crazy he's following is like he's essentially gone from zero uh public awareness to being number three in the republican race um yeah. past you know the old vp like just past a lot of people and he's um he's he's getting really good traction and he's something of of like really fresh energy He's 37, I think he's 38 now actually. And it's pretty cool to see somebody that young. I am biased because he's Indian, but really I'm looking past that. He's so smart, he's an entrepreneur, he has no political experience whatsoever. And he's so clear, so upfront. Um, and so I'm really excited to see what happens with him. You know, RFK Jr is interesting, but I think he's so focused just on health and vaccine and and um, and so I, I don't know about him per se. And I think just the, my opinion is I think the U S in general is tired of these octogenarians running the government because I just don't think we're going to see any real material change. And I think Gen Xers and millennials, I think are looking for something different. And I think this Vivek guy is, is hitting it on the head, not only for the younger generation, but he's speaking to all people from all age groups, all across the country, and it's resonating. So I'd love to get you guys' feedback on that. Um, let's see, what else? I, I really do want to ask a question 
I'll ask it now and I'd love to maybe process it uh, together on the group. I'd love to know if we lost everything right now or maybe a few years ago and you had a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars or $10 million, what would you do? What would you do if you lost everything and you had a hundred thousand dollars, meaning somebody gave you a hundred grand or a million or 10 million. And would your answers be different depending on how much money you had and what would you do about it? And what would you do to like get your family back on your feet? I think that's a good question, but it's also relevant to people. Um, and so I, I thought I'd ask that question, but I'm excited to go home. I'm leaving Barcelona. I'm excited to go home, and that's what's going on with me. I will turn it to Maddie. A. Go, Bubba. <laughs> well, I think your 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 one question around if you lose it all and you have money, that should be a great topic that I think theoretically we could all dig into next week on the podcast and come up because I think that's a real scenario for one a lot of people right now. It's a potential scenario for people in the very near future. And it's a for sure scenario for anybody that is an entrepreneur, a business owner, taking investments, taking risk in the course of their timeline. So I think we should definitely save more time for that. Um, in terms of the present, and things are gonna start heating up, right? I'm, I'm an independent. I don't like a lot of what I see on the far right. I don't like a lot of what I see on the far left. I don't feel like it represents me and, and, and my family values and what we're doing. But I would say if I had to pick a side, I am disgusted by what I see on the left. And I lean a little bit more right based on my values, my pocketbook. And I mean, the left's plan is to essentially have, you know, Trump in a prison sale by Labor Day of 2024. So he can't debate, he can't, you know, campaign, he can't run for office. I think that's very interesting from the perspective of it, it, he has such a unique opportunity to actually unite the country when it is so divided and yet he can't get out of his own way with his personality and his narcissism, right? Mm. Righteousness versus mm. narcissism, I think ah. is a perfect example um, there. Um, I guarantee I, he's I, done fraud in real estate. 100%. <laughs> I guarantee you he has too. I bet he has. I know that. And and while um, I am not necessarily aligned with Trump in terms of like him being a representative of who I am, I love that he's America first. I do believe he wants to drain the, the swamp and the cronyism and the capital, you know, the um, the you know, the the issues that are kind of with the government. Um, and he's somebody that's uncontrollable. He's not on anybody's payroll. And that makes it very interesting to follow someone like that because I believe there's a level of transparency with him that whether you love him or hate him, I like knowing who he is, where he stands, and ultimately the fact that he doesn't have the same hooks that the other uh, candidates do. Ron DeSantis is a perfect example. I think he's yeah. much more well-spoken. I think I can align with a lot of his values and his policy, but at the end of the day, he's still on someone's payroll and it's been very evident with his stances and then certain people saying stuff and all of a sudden he's switching his stance because of some big donor saying, you want my money on your campaign? Well, you got to back this or say this or not say that. So I do like RFK. Um, mm. I cannot stand listening to him. And I think that actually is going to hurt him as a candidate. It sounds weird to say that, but he's really hard to listen to. But I do he's think hard to, a lot he's of, hard to listen to. But a lot of his stances are very middle and I think more representative of a lot of the people on both sides that fall in the middle. So he's an interesting candidate, but the, the left will not allow him to run because he's not too, as progressive as the left wants. Um, and I love, and I think why I love Vivek is because I think he is a perfect case study, whether he wins or not, which I don't think he will. I don't think he will get the primary. He's a very interesting case study from the perspective of he is campaigning and approaching this from a perspective that no other candidate has. I don't know if you followed his um, kind of State of the Union podcast live that he did with uh, Pat um, David Bett. And it got a lot of good traction. 
it reached a lot of people that other candidates aren't reaching. And I think we're starting to turn this corner in politics and how things have been done and how they're going to be done going forward. And he is the person that I'm pointing to as a case yep. study for other younger candidates to follow. And I like a lot of All what candidates. he says. He's well-spoken. He has a very moderate and fair and empathetic stance, but also he's got his flag planted on certain things that um, people will or won't like. But I just like his approach and how he's going about it. Dude's sharp. He's young. I want more of that in our government. We do need to drain the swamp. I do believe that it's a uniparty now and not a right and a left. Um, and it's whoever's got the most money that's dictating and pulling a lot of the strings. And I think this presidential election, if I'm going to get real extreme and out there, and I'll leave it with this, Trump should win. And the left will not allow it. It will not happen. They will pull something, in my opinion, call it conspiracy theory or not. There is no way the government, the elite uniparty will allow Trump to get in office ever again. There will be a civil war before that happens. And there could be some things that they do that create some massive tension and division going forward. I think this is going to be the most contentious presidential campaign and election we've ever seen in the history of our United States. And I think it will set a tone and create, um, it will create some major division going forward, no matter who wins worse than it already is today. Yeah. I think Vivek's going all the way. Mooch, go. The, <laughs> um, you know, in our chat, we hear, we see Trump 2028, the, he's going to run for the rest of his life, man. Um, uh. I think, I think I marry, I, I think I mirror a lot of Maddie's stuff. I think the only problem, any candidate that can't win shouldn't be running. But, but if, but anybody that should, that is going to win needs to have the never give up scenario. So that's why we have all these other people. I can't wait to talk about next week about what we would do if we went back to zero. I've done it three times. I know exactly what I would do next time, but knock on wood, I'm done with that. Uh, <laughs> That's why I want to ask the question because if, yeah. if Mooch doesn't, people don't know Mooch's story. It's incredible. So we need to we need to process that. Yeah. So I know the I know the zero and back. I know exactly what I would do. And people, I think people be uh, yeah. I don't know if they'll be excited or not. I just I did a quick Google of like who are the ten Republican candidates right now? Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley. We've heard about Nikki Haley a lot on the All In podcast. Uh, Glenn Youngkin, Mike Pence, Chris Christie, Vivek, uh, Doug Burgum, and uh, Asa Hutchinson. So a lot of people that are in government already. Um, you know, uh, what I would really like to see is Jamie Dimon or Mark Cuban or Steven Schwartzman, you know, the owner of Blackstone. You know, whenever, any time when somebody came out with their biography, when Schwartzman came out with his What It Takes biography a couple years ago about Blackstone, I was book. really hoping that he was doing that so he could see if he should run for president and see how many people care about his story. Because what, um, why Trump was successful is he was a non-politician that loved his country and he knew how to run businesses and he didn't care about, you know, he could hire and fire people. So he could hire and fire people in other countries. He could like do the hard things, didn't care. Um, who I think would be best equipped to run our country is not a politician. I think a big successful business person that's already done everything else in the world that would say, you know what? I've done it all. I don't need more money. I don't need more anything. Let me go try my hand at being president. So I don't, we don't have one of those guys running. I mean, maybe Vivek's one of the most similar ones, but right now I'm not looking at that list saying I'll be really excited about uh, any of those. I think that it takes a politic. I think it takes a entrepreneur that doesn't give an F about anything because they have enough money and everything else. It doesn't really matter. I think it's going to take an entrepreneur not a politician. And unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get it. Um, I also am a uh, man. We're going to get canceled. I'm a big fan of Trump, but I also know that the, but who knows if his ship has sailed and if him staying in the election really just inhibits the Trump replacement that I would love to see. Um, I could look at all those other candidates and say, I mean, I if love Trump this walks job, away, there's a whole slew of people that will come up. There are other entrepreneurs that would come on 
mm-hmm. not, but no entrepreneur is going to come on and run against Trump. No. Because he is the entrepreneur that also has the ability to be polarizing. And I think about Mark Cuban, for example, like, and he, you know, he, who knows if he has any interest ever or not in something like that. But people, why did people like Trump? Well, he had TV shows. He was recognizable. He was funny. And he was a successful business guy. Like you think about like Arnold Schwarzenegger is the governor of California years ago. You think about Ronald Reagan used to be an actor uh, before he became president. Likeable. Like, like the way that an entrepreneur gets to come in is if it's an entrepreneur that's also likable, that also has some sort of TV persona. Um, that's the magic pill that we don't have. So, um, so I'm mm. disappointed with what I see on our election prospects right now. And um, yeah, Mikey. Joe Rogan. It goes back to people who have influence. When you talk about people outside of politics, it's people who have influence, right? I mean, it's why and we ability, all have podcasts, though. huh? So you have you have to have influence, but also to be the president, you also be, have to be capable of running multi gazillion dollar companies. That's yeah, like sure. the biggest co- the biggest company in the world. So you have to have you influence who, and ability. You know who I think is going to be a future presidential candidate that fits that bill, and they've already said they want to do it. Hmm. Logan is Paul. That- the, is well, that the I don't know that CEO skills. Well, I'll have to read. The, I'll have to watch his documentary. Mm-hmm. Prime is going to end up being a multi-billion-dollar exit for him. Crazy, Mikey, take us home. Have you guys read The Fourth Turning? Mm-mm. No. It's a really good book that came out. I don't know, 10, 10, 12 years ago. But they go back and they track cycles in history, and they just came out with a new book called The Fourth Turning Is Here. And it talks about how, um, and again, these cycles, they go way back thousands of years and things happen in 20 and ultimately 80 and 120 year cycles. Um, so the fourth turning, I think it was written in the early, like maybe 2012, they go back and track all of this. And then the new book that just came out, I'm not finished with it yet, but it's again, it's called the fourth turning is here. And they talk about how, um, the polarization and, and civil conflict, global war, all the above. Like if you look at the timelines, it has to culminate in the next like five to 10 years. So like 2030 ish. And so, by the way, I'm not saying we should just throw our hands in the air and not worry about any of it. But what I am saying is that, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm a half a glass half full guy, but, but also like, I think we're just in this really pivotal time that, it just has to get a little bit more um, challenging. I mean, when you look at, this will be a conversation for another day, but when you look at like what we're saying with globalization and, and the divisions of countries and, you know, the United States being a global power for the last, you know, 80 years, really, if you look at, if you read the fourth turning and you see everything that's happened in, in 20 year blocks, it, it kind of makes sense. And so, you know, back to the presidency, I, I think things are going to have to get a little bit worse before we rally around someone that's actually going to pull us together. A middle of the road kind of person. Like I'm a huge fan of, just to answer the question, I'm actually a huge fan of, of RFK myself. Like I just think that, and Ashish, you said earlier, you know, his focus on vaccines and all that. What's interesting is he's not really that focused. He's got a lot of other amazing, you know, viewpoints. Everyone just focuses him on that. Yeah. And that's the real problem that I think, you know, he's up against, but you know, when you look at some of these middle leaning characters, like I've been saying this for years, the pendulum has to swing. And I don't, I don't, whether it's right or left, I'm kind of like where Maddie is. I'm more of a centrist. And, uh, but you know, if RFK had a chance, like it'd be the first time that I'd vote Democrat of my life probably. Um, but I think things have to get a little bit worse before we come together and rally around someone that can actually be more of a centrist. I think we're going to continue to swing a little bit longer you know, back and forth to extremism. Um, and so I don't, I just don't think it kind of matters at this point in time. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put too much stock into any one candidate because I don't think we're far enough gone yet where we're going to mm-hmm. rally as a country around someone that could actually make a difference. It's just my, my two that. cents. Yeah. And we go full circle to the story of luck and fraud. Yeah. <laughs> Luck and fraud and back. I think if we're ready to close this out, top of the pyramid, the top of the pyramid. You know, I think if we're ready to close this out, guys, listeners, if you guys are listening to this or watching us on YouTube, 
you could probably see how much fun we're having and how this could easily become a three or a four hour conversation and how hard we are working to actually like get our point across quickly. We're all podcasters. We're all used to going through this. And so we're asking you guys to continue to give us feedback and bear with us as we're having like the super exciting time. And I think today we're like, we'll get out of here in an hour. And it was probably an hour and 20 and thanks, maybe an hour and 30. And thanks for being here as we do this. Because again, like we love these topics and each one of us has a list of things we still want to talk about and hit on these. So we will get better at our craft with this as we start to nail some things. You know, next week we're going to talk about what would we do if we went to zero? Maybe we'll get to talk about, I really think we should spend five or 10 minutes on Ukraine next time because I think there's this philosophical question. I love the philosophical stuff that we did today when I went and took a philosophy class in college, that, you know, right and wrong. We got to learn that it depended on culture. As we wrap with our fire round question, it's really quick. It's going to be like a one word answer from you guys. So the, but it goes back to, as we think about presidential candidates and right and wrong, I got two characters in the world. So Bill Gates selling a product at the beginning that he didn't own, committing fraud, you know, lying to make it, it, it to then build his gazillion dollar empire or Walt from Breaking Bad. So the one answer question, the one, yeah, the one word question, one, one, you know, the answer I'm looking for, Walt, is it immoral what he did? You know, and like we could do like immoral, unethical, whatever the word is, but there's all this gray area that we live in. And we say if it's 100,000, doesn't matter if it's 10 million, it does. Walt, immoral, unethical, or no, because of what he was going through. And then Bill Gates, immoral, unethical, or no. One word answer, Maddie, you're first. What's unethical? Your... Both of them. What, what, what did he say? Both I of say, them. yeah. Unethical. Walter, Walter White, immoral and right. unethical, <laughs> but I think I think Gates is unethical. That moment. All right, cool. Mike Ayala. Uh, immoral, unethical, desperate. Both. Both. Well, maybe not. Bill Gates probably wasn't desperate. I don't know. I don't have enough context around Bill Gates, like honestly. Go watch that Pirates of Silicon Valley. You're going to love it. The, he sucks uh, either way. Yeah. I, yeah, but, I, you I, can, I just, but you care about something else. I'm talking about b building building a billion dollar empire by selling a product he didn't own within like a 24, you know, like, all right, Ash, up to you. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know enough of the story uh, of Bill Gates at the early stage. I will watch that documentary. I think that the word that shows up for me that makes them similar is that they were both persistent. I don't know is if that, it was that's, your final answer? Not. that's my final right. answer. I think the not giving up thing that is deep inside us could take any one of us to the edge of unethical and immoral. The things that I would not do to feed my kids is a very small list, unfortunately, for right or wrong. So the mm -hmm. ability, the, the, the not give it up thing, I think there people are a lot more willing uh, to be there. Immoral, unethical, I think what Bill Gates did was brilliant when I saw it. And I use the story all the time and the, but yes, in the law, it could have been very, very questionable. Instead, he became a gazillionaire. Um, Walt, man, would I do something like that for my family? Uh, I hope not at this point in my life, uh, but I've done some very questionable things before. So was his immoral, I think it Sorry, one word answer um, <laughs> is my two word answer. It was okay until he killed somebody. So that's how philosophies can act, philosophical <laughs> stuff can actually change. I think there's becomes a point of like doing a little white lie or gray area is okay, but size matters. Let's say that. Yeah. So when it comes to our philosophical argument of the day, I'm going to finish that with size matters. Ash, as our hostess with the Moses, any final thoughts as, as you close this out for us? I think you did a great job, Mooch. I think this was a really good episode. I love how you called out to the audience. You know, guys, we are definitely still piloting this. I think this has been super fun for us. We're getting a lot of value out of it, having a lot of fun doing it. Hopefully you guys will too, and we'll just get better at picking topics and providing feedback and asking questions, um, really focused on how you can get the most value out of it. So 
you know, Maddie has a, a phone number that he's dropped in the show notes. So make sure you give us feedback. You can communicate to any of us on our Instagram handles, on any of our podcasts, but leave comments. Um, we're dropping it everywhere until we don't. Um, so just keep engaging with us and uh, letting us know what you love, what you don't love. And good seeing you boys. We'll see you next time. You guys were amazing today. Great stuff. Good job.